Um, I think it's one of the features of knowing that you're at the right conference when every single talk that comes up makes you think, oh, I need to change that slide now to make that connection with that talk. And the last two, the last few this morning have been uh, examples like that that I haven't been able to include. But some of the things that you mentioned about there, in particular that feedback loop, it's like we'll see that here and just want to make that connection. Um, okay, so we've been talking about um, inside the box, outside the box, right? So one of the inside the box statements that uh, we are all pushing against perhaps is that memory, learning, cognition and problem solving uh, only occur in organisms like us or organisms with brains or organisms with at least with neurons or something like that. And in the various talks that we've seen, we've seen lots of examples where mechanisms of memory and learning and such like are occurring in organisms that are outside of that particular box, that way of thinking. Um, how do those processes occur? Now, they might be different details in different uh, uh, examples, and sometimes the mechanisms are known, and sometimes we're just reporting phen phenomena. How do we explain it in a more general sense? Oh, we know how to explain it in a more general sense, says the skeptical voice from inside the box. Well, if there is anything clever happening, and I'm not saying that there is, but if there is, then it must be evolved by natural selection, which of course is business as usual. Uh, because natural selection is the mechanism that explains all adaptation in biology, so anything clever must be a product of natural selection. How do we know that natural selection is the source of all biological adaptation? Well, you know, there's all the evidence about evolution has occurred, the tree of life, fossil record, and the rest of it, direct evidence that the mechanisms of natural selection are operating. And there's also a sort of logical argument that, well, it must be the source of all adaptation because the other theories that we have, you know, Lamarck and such like, well, they don't work, do they? Um, but even if we were to imagine the possibility of a different theory in future, it just couldn't be. It's the only possible theory that there could be. Dawkins would say that's universal Darwinism. So whereas Darwinism is the idea that natural selection is the mechanism, as it happens, that produced all biological adaptation here on Earth, universal Darwinism is that natural selection is the only possible way that anything can get better by itself, whether it's in a biological substrate or not. Uh, by itself meaning I without design. So that's not just Darwinism, that's Darwinism on a pedestal. Right? Uh, okay, so that would mean that all of these interesting phenomena that we see, like, whilst they're interesting and they're occurring in organisms that we didn't expect them to occur in, are all products of evolution by natural selection. So the claim, my claim is that natural selection is not the only possible source uh, of naturally occurring source of adaptation. Natural induction is a different adaptive mechanism that occurs spontaneously in dynamical systems with suitable natural properties. And that has the implication that learning and problem solving and adaptation are not the exception that we should expect them, uh, that they would happen spontaneously in biological networks or dynamical systems of the, with the right properties. Uh, they don't need special mechanisms put there by natural selection for that to occur. Why induction? Well, induction is the basis of all learning, right? It's a formulation of general rules from specific examples. You need it to do proper learning, not just memorizing things or rote learning, but generalization that goes beyond the training data. Induction is necessary for that. Uh, of course, a type of induction that many of us are familiar with is associative induction, which is just learning what goes together. A mechanism that can provide that in brains is neurons that fire together, wire together, which seems like a very neural-specific kind of mechanism, but it's really a really simple principle. It's just a principle of positive feedback on correlations. The more two things have co-occurred in the past, the more the connection between them changes in the direction that makes them more likely to co-occur again in future. That's all that principle is. And in the context of artificial neural networks and perhaps biological ones, it can do all sorts of cool things, including learning to solve constraint optimization problems better with experience, which will become relevant. So whereas brains and machine learning systems do induction because they're selected or evolved to do induction for that purpose, natural induction occurs spontaneously in dynamical systems with suitable properties without being selected or designed for that purpose. The conditions for it to occur are that you have a dynamical system described by a network of connections, interactions between your state variables, like well, what dynamical system isn't described like that? And you have disturbances, shocks or perturbations that the system is experiencing. 
And the extra detail is that they have viscoelastic connections, that the connections change over time in a way that they just give way slightly under stress. Their connections are not perfectly elastic. So in the example of a perfect spring, you could extend the spring. When you let it go, it goes back to the exact same length that it started from. But in a viscoelastic spring, which all real springs are, you stretch them too far or for too long. When you let them go, they don't quite go back all the way. That's all viscoelasticity means. Now, I'm going to have to broaden our idea about what adaptation means, because if we define adaptation as the product of natural selection, then you can't possibly have another mechanism for doing it. I'm going to define it as non-trivial optimization. We could say that a system has adaptive organization if it generates states that are exceptional with respect to the resolution of constraints among its components. That's basically a Paleian uh, notion of the appearance of design. An example computationally that you might be familiar with is if you could solve a Sudoku puzzle, then a system that could do that is exhibiting adaptation. It's finding a particular configuration that resolves all the constraints among its components. Of course, it doesn't have to be perfectly optimal. Natural selection doesn't do globally optimal solutions, but it has to be non-trivial. Okay, so here's the gist of how natural selection works. It depends on two observations about physical systems. First, physical systems optimize spontaneously in a weak sense, in the sense that they naturally find local minima in their intrinsic energy minimization problem. And physical systems also learn in a weak sense. I'll do some examples of that in a minute. That's already known. But what's interesting is when you put these two things together, optimization, when they're occurring in the same system at the same time, the weak optimization weakly informs the learning process, and the learning process weakly informs the optimization process, changing the state, changing the internal architecture. That gives you a physical system that learns to optimize better with experience. So how does the physical optimization work? Well, that just says, suppose you have a system of problem parameters that describe some constraint function or objective function or a potential function, then the natural dynamics of the system is going to be that whatever state it starts from, it's going to roll downhill. It's going to find a local minimum in that energy function. But it only finds local optima, right? It's just, that's a trivial kind of optimization. I don't want to call a ball rolling downhill adaptation. Okay, what about physical systems learning? Uh, Menikam Stern provides a great review of examples of physical systems that can learn in all sorts of different substrates from memristors to origami. But the general principle here is very simple. Here we have a system that has an internal architecture of interactions between its components that's defining its dynamics. And when you leave it in a particular state for a while, the internal architecture just gives way a little bit. The, arc, the surface of that dynamical system, of the dynamics of that system, changes in a way that relaxes. The internal structure of the system gives way slightly, accommodating to the frustrations in the internal interactions that are created by the current system state. But I don't want to call just giving way adaptation either. Uh, that's not how I'm defining it. But those two things can happen in the same dynamical system at the same time. In one case, we were calling them a system of problem parameters that were defining the dynamics of the system. And in the other case, we were calling them, let's see if I can make this point. Yeah. In the one case, we were calling them problem parameters. They define the dynamics of the system, and we find locally optimal solutions. In the other case, we call them, oh, that's really hard to point with, uh, model parameters. They're supposed to be doing a model of what's going on in the outside world, but they're the same thing, really. They're the same internal architecture of our dynamical system. In the one case, we're relaxing the state variables given the current values of the connections. In the other case, we're relaxing the connections given the current values of the state variables, but they're just both uh, variables in us in the same dynamical system. When we put those, when those two things are happening in the same system at the same time, if we were to allow the ball to roll downhill and find a locally optimal solution, and then we were to randomize its position and let it roll downhill again, and randomize its position and let it roll downhill again, if the internal architecture doesn't change, then you just have a distribution of local optima. But at the same time, the landscape is slowly or slightly giving way to the position of the ball over that distribution of behavior, that distribution of state space, uh, which means that the local optimization informs which structural changes happen, which structural changes happen, the ones which are under stress given the position, the current position of the state. And how does that change the dynamics of the ball, right? That change in the energy function changes how the ball rolls down the hill. 
In particular, it makes it more likely to go to places that it's been to before because the relaxation tends to increase the basin of attraction for those states. That gives you an optimization process that rolls downhill better with experience. It's better than locally optimal solutions. And that's what I mean by non-trivial optimization, that it has to do better than just rolling down to the nearest local optimum. So let's do a numerical simulation. This is done by Chris Buckley. You have a system of masses connected by springs. You randomize the position of the masses and you let them go and the springs push them around until they find a local equilibrium. That's just the dynamics find a local minimum in the energy function. That's not adaptation, that's just what dynamical systems do. Now we introduce the disturbances. So we randomize the position of the masses and let it equilibrate, randomize the position of the masses and let it equilibrate again, randomize the position of the masses and let it equilibrate again. Shocks or perturbations to the system. And that enables us to plot a distribution of the energies of the local minima that are found. That's still not adaptation, that's just exploring the dynamics of your system. But this is with perfect springs, ideal springs, which don't give way under stress. What happens if we use real springs that deform slightly over time? Well, the way that they deform is, a, is influenced, informed by the distribution of states that the system has visited. And the distribution of states that the system visits is modified by the deformation in the springs. And over time, that changes the dynamics of the springs, and we see that it changes in a way which finds particularly low energy configurations and eventually converges on one particular state, which is lower energy than any of the other states which were found without such learning. So the system becomes exceptional in its ability to find configurations uh, that resolve constraints among its components, and that's what I mean by adaptation. Hold on a minute, says the skeptical voice of reason from inside the box. Energy minimization isn't problem solving. It's just what dynamical systems do. So, you know, this is just a physical system. It's just doing what it does. It can't be adaptation. You can't call that adaptation. So let's see if I can clarify a little bit by seeing if it can solve a constraint problem that's not its own dynamics, but sort of external to it. So we'll set up one system of springs, which represents the constraints of a problem that says, you know, if this one is here, that one has to be there. It's the same as Hotfield and Tank did in their model. Those springs are not going to change. We're going to call those the problem springs. It's like that's the problem that's out there in the world. And to that, we add a separate set of internal springs. These springs are springs which give way under stress. So the dynamics of the system is a combination of the problem and the uh, internal dynamics through their shared interface, the position of the masses. And the behavior of that is just the same, uh, that we have uh, particularly low energy configurations in the red dots. Can you see the difference in the color? Yeah, you can. It's slightly better up there than down here. So when you use the real springs, the combination of the two, adding the real springs in addition to the ideal springs, which represent the unchangeable problem, that gives you the same effect. So it finds configurations that resolve constraints among its components created by an external problem that it can't change. That difference between the low energy configurations found by adding the real springs and the best of the configurations that were found with the ideal springs, that's explained by induction. It's not just memorizing the best thing it found in the past and making it more likely, it's going beyond that. Uh, so it is just energy minimization, which is why you'd expect to find it everywhere, but it's important that it's happening at two levels simultaneously. It's energy minimization in the state configuration and it's energy minimization in the connections or the interactions between the states. And one informs the other, the state configurations. It's always true that connections never get more frustrated over time. They get less frustrated. They just give up. They just relax. But which ones give up and which ones don't, that changes the dynamics of the system in a way which is specific to its history. So it's not just rolling downhill. It's learning to roll downhill better with experience because the connections are requiring knowledge of the problem structure that's equivalent to associative learning learning like a neural network. So in the context of an organism with a neural network, we're not surprised that you can exhibit global adaptation ability in networks of simple components. And unsupervised distributed associative learning is sufficient to do that, like Hebb's rule. And that doesn't require any centralized control or any global feedback or reward mechanism. It only requires positive feedback on correlations to do that. And that's what viscoelastic connections do for free. They give you positive feedback on correlations. It stretches this way because that was the way that you stretched in, which makes it more likely to go that way to have that particular separation of the masses in future. So that means that networks of viscoelastic connections 
can do the same global adaptation ability that learning neural networks can do without being selected or designed for that purpose. So to summarize this part, natural induction provides adaptation in the sense that it finds exceptionally good solutions. In fact, it finds better solutions than natural selection does, because natural selection just climbs to the nearest local adaptive peak in the landscape, right? At best, if you're lucky, it finds the nearest adaptive peak. And I actually defined adaptation that you have to do better than that. It's not more clever because it goes up rather than going down, right? It's just the nearest local optimum. It isn't a form of natural selection. It's a different mechanism. There isn't any selection here, right? There's only one network. There's not a population. Neither the network nor its components are reproducing. The masses and the springs are not reproducing either. It's not about separating the things you want to retain from the things you want to discard, a variational process in Sober's language. It's a knowledge acquisition, acquisition process, a transformational process, a learning process. It isn't differential survival and reproduction. It's the differential easing of frustrations in the relationships between components. And because it's a different mechanism, that means it has different conditions on where it would apply. It would, can apply in systems that don't have populations of evolutionary units. And another reason that you know it isn't natural selection is because it can solve problems that natural selection can't solve. It's a smarter uh, adaptive process than natural selection. Thirdly, uh, it's natural in the sense that it would occur spontaneously without being selected or designed for that purpose in any dynamical system that has viscoelastic connections and subject to disturbances. To the extent that interactions give way under stress and the system is subject to disturbances or shocks, that any dynamical system with, uh, uh, would exhibit adaptation by natural induction. So natural selection isn't the only logical possible source of adaptive organization. So you can keep Darwin if you like, but he doesn't need to be on that pedestal. Implications. Well, that there is another adaptive mechanism matters to what you think can be a source or a leader of adaptation. Arguments of the form, if it isn't natural selection, doesn't apply, then it can't be adapted, no longer hold. So those kinds of arguments for dismissing phenotypic plasticity or niche construction as sources of adaptation don't hold. We need to look at the details more carefully. Um, it also matters to the general prohibition of the possibility of adaptation in systems that aren't evolutionary units, like loose social groups or ecological communities or the biosphere as a whole. You can't use the argument that the biosphere as a whole can't be adapted because there isn't a population of planets, right? Because that depends on the assumption that natural selection is the only mechanism that can provide adaptation. It also means then that we don't necessarily have to involve natural selection in explanations for why those kinds of systems can do the kinds of things that they can do. Memory and learning are quite natural in dynamical systems that have some kind of plasticity. And in a network, syst um, network system, that develops into problem solving and adaptation in the way that I showed. OK, well, maybe, says the skeptical voice of reason from inside the box. But the vast majority of clever things in biology are adaptations of organisms that are a consequence of evolution by natural selection not these esoteric examples you're talking about. And genes aren't viscoelastic connections. Genetic changes only happen by random variation and selection. Well, says Richard from outside the box. Natural induction is a substrate independent algorithm, right? Like natural selection is. It occurs in dynamical systems with suitable properties. And biology is full of networks and generally subject to disturbances. And stressed connections tend to give way. One of the ways that connections could change could be that connections could evolve through random variation and natural selection. And the direction that selection would act would be to relieve the frustrations in the interactions of the network. So it could be that the connections in an dynamical system are changing by random variation and natural selection. And the process at the consequence of that at the system level is that you've got natural induction working at the network level. But natural induction at the network level is explaining the orchestration of the natural selection that's happening at the connection level. Two quick examples of what I call the interaction between those two things, evolution by natural induction. One in a gene regulation network where the evolution of traits evolve given the current genetic interactions, the developmental process that you have now, and the gene interactions evolve given the phenotype that is being selected right now. And the two of those together at the same time in a system that is subject to disturbances or epistolic selection gives you a gene regulation network that learns to evolve better with experience. 
demonstrating the evolution of long-term evolvability without long-term selection, right? There's no lineage selection going on here. Second example is in a network that isn't an evolutionary unit, an ecological community, where local Volterra ecological dynamics change the species densities given the community interactions, but the community interactions evolve to accommodate the current species densities. And if those two things happen in the same ecological community at the same time, plus disturbances, which in this case would be ecological disturbances for anything from forest fires to tropical storms, then you get an ecology that learns to discover better than locally optimal ecological phenotypes. And Dan Power showed that if you set up the original interactions of your local Volterra matrix to represent the rules of Sudoku, then the ecosystem can learn to solve Sudoku puzzles, which means that you have adaptation at the system level or systemic intelligence without system level selection. The selection in the model is only working on the level of individuals within each species, not at the community level. So the connections are changing by random variation and selection after all. So natural selection does all the explaining I need. Well, let's have a look at an analogy between cognition and electricity. Suppose that you had a theory, you wanted to know how cognition worked, and you had a theory that it worked by electricity. And you go poking around in a brain and you say, oh, look, it does work by electricity. There's lots of electricity going on here. And my theory about potential difference and resistance and charge says that this much charge should flow. And my theory is perfect. It explains how all the electricity flows. But does a theory of electricity do all the explaining you need for cognition? So what's the algorithm of biological evolution? Suppose you have a theory that says it's natural selection. Well, natural selection occurs. You go poking around in the genetics of populations and you find out that the gene frequencies change in the way that you thought that they did according to your theory and you're not wrong about that. But does that do all the explaining that you need? In gene networks and ecological communities, natural selection describes how the connections change, but it doesn't dis explain why this connection changed, not that connection. Why were these the connections that changed? It can't explain connections changing in a way that gives you long-term evolvability without long-term selection or system-level intelligence without system-level selection. But the principles of associative learning familiar in cognitive systems do. So the theory of natural selection is correct, like a theory of electricity is correct. But, and it doesn't actually say that much. It just it more or less says, you know, when things are pushed, they tend to go in the direction that they're pushed. What we really need to understand is how that works at a systemic level. And that has the potential to be an algorithm that's more like cognition that doesn't need natural selection to explain it. it it's it's uh, not that natural selection explains all of that clever cognitive stuff. It's more like the principles of cognition and learning and memory are, in, are part of our explanation of how biological ev evolution works. So with that, I want to thank my network, and in particular, David, for uh, generously making it possible for me to be here and all of you to be here, and I I'm, thank you very much. Our next speaker is going to be remote. Yes, uh, Shapiro, Dr. Shapiro from University of Chicago. So while they are setting that up, we have time for a couple of questions at most. So go ahead, please. Over there. Yeah. OK, thanks, Richard, for the talk. Uh, I'm kind of worried for one reason. Um, I remember 30 years ago, my mentor, Brian Goodwin, he, he was uh, saying very rightly that, you know, the, it's not functioning? No, it's not. Oh, get closer. all right. You can bend down. Okay, yeah. I, I will, I will. Um, you were saying that you have to be very careful in saying that, you know, genes are the central thing because in, and he was criticizing uh, the book by, by um, Richard Dawkins, the idea that, you know, gene central topic explains everything, when in reality it's the organism which we need to understand where it comes from. And one thing I kind of worry, in a way I like it, so I'm kind of the devil's advocate here, but I kind of like your analogy, but isn't it kind of risky to use this analogy in the sense that we might be ignoring again the organism? Um, because we need to explain how these uh, networks emerge, uh, how, how they use sensors to actually explore the walls and the environment. And in the end, you have entities that self-replicate, and that's very central for understanding evolution. So to what extent the analogy may be short in, in getting there? Well, I, yes, I'm certainly not saying that we 
don't want to include organisms in our understanding of how adaptation happens. I just want to suggest that we don't need to give natural selection exclusive rights to explaining how the organisms had the organi organization that they do. Um, did, did, that, did I miss your point? Um, no, what I'm saying is, I mean, I, I, I totally agree in the sense that natural selection is part of the story. Uh, but we have a lot of order for free uh, constraints and things that, uh, in, in my opinion, very strongly canalize uh, the potential of the possible in evolution. Sure. Just it's that the, the organism is kind of a central thing, and we need to provide explanations for Sure. So, I mean, what makes an organism more than the sum of its parts, right? So the order for free self-organization story explains how uh, systems can be ordered without um, without natural selection, and that's the, due to the natural dynamics of their physical properties. But we need to do more than just explain order, right? We need to explain adaptation. And in order for an organism to be a thing that can be an adaptive, um, you know, a thing that you can ask about whether it's adapted or not, it needs to be an integrated system of its parts and not just a bag of parts. And the difference between a bag of parts and an integrated system is the nature or organization of the relationships between those parts. So when we're talking about you know, things like the transitions in individuality and major transitions that were mentioned earlier, there aren't any organisms without transitions that get us from the bag of parts to the organism stage. And the, the way in which the relationships between parts create organisms is, um, is part of the thing that we need to explain. And we can't use that teleological um, um, idea of like, well, if they didn't, then we wouldn't have had an organism. It's like we needed to explain things in a bottom-up way. So that's exactly what I'm trying to offer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh. <clears throat>